Well, we are back. Welcome back. Welcome back, Dave. Welcome, Welcome back, back, Adam. Um, back Wednesday. to the podcast, the Brown Amplification Podcast that we do on a regular occasion uh, for our own mutual benefit, for your benefit and for our benefit. <laughs> it's cheaper than therapy. It's cheaper than therapy for us. And less effective. And less effective. Uh, but at some point in time, we hope to say something of value enough to our listeners that they will continue to return to listen again. And then at some point, spend their hard-earned money on a brown amplification panel. Our goal is to convince you so much that we're such wonderful people that at the end of this, you're like, I don't even care if their pill's any good. I'm just buying it because I like them. Mm. So we're so moving welcome. into a nonprofit. We're, just, <laughs> yeah. we're selling you on a mission. So, yes, that's what we're doing. So uh, first uh, part of this segment today is what's on the news, Adam? What's on the news? Well, um, I'm, I need to pull this up again, but someone in Australia found a really big rock. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to find it, but I always really enjoy um, your homeland's news. Yeah. Early in the morning, the best thing to do is to listen to Australian news. Don't listen to American news because it's just depressing mm -hmm. and pointless and you'll just feel bad about your life. But Australian news... Oh, it's great. Australia is like the Florida of countries. You just never know what, what you're going to get. <laughs> What's happening in Australian news today, Adam? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying Florida. To... <laughs> so are you ready? Uh, I wanted to just bring up some of my favorite Australian headlines. One of my favorite ones. Woman comes home to find pole dancing koala. That's one we could the dive koala into. koala was pole dancing? Yeah. Australian government accused of being too obsessed with hugging koalas. Country wow. is allegedly spending hundreds of thousands on contact with the marsupials. I can go through all ha this. Have you ever hugged a koala, though, Adam? I have. Have you? Yeah, it just was a little needy. And so. I had a bad experience with that. Bad nudes. Melbourne holds largest ever world naked bike ride. So there's, <laughs> there's something. For okay, us. so here's a true story. I was in Philadelphia doing a corporate gig a while ago, back mm -hmm. when the world wasn't crazy. Mm -hmm. And the uh, place we were staying at was a hotel that had, and you know, looked across out of the city. And then in the afternoon, we were standing and looking out across the city and a whole bunch of naked people on bicycles decided just to ride straight past the building. And we had no idea what was going on and found out later, it was one of the largest naked bike riding events in America, happening right there, that day that I was there. Now, Ben, you and I uh, ride bicycles. We do. Uh, with some and that's regularity. that's all that I could think about was how painful it would yeah. be to ride miles and miles on a bike naked. I mean, I don't want to go into any excessive detail here, but, you know, shorts with padding are a big deal when you're, big when deal. you're cycling. Yes. Um, you know, because the, the seat comfort is a big thing. It, you can get really sore on your, on your sit bones mm -hmm. riding a, a bike, but also, you know, there's other areas of discomfort when you're cycling. And, um, I'm just trying to comprehend <laughs> how you could possibly cycle in the nude. I know it was, I, I feel like you would need some special sort of seat arrangement. It's possible, uh, although I saw people that were riding by and was like, no, those are not like super comfy seats. Those are just regular old bike seats. And there were hundreds of them, hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds. And, I, and they just kept coming and I was so confused. But, you know, I mean, we're not talking about riding as far as, you know, say somebody from another pedal company who's, in, who's insane when he rides as far as he rides. So we're not talking about a 50 miler here. No. Josh Scott and you and your craziness, uh, but no, we we're just talking about. I don't. I'm pretty sure he never rides in the nude. <laughs> Josh Scott, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> for, for all our sakes, uh, yes. Any other headlines for the day? Oh, we have we have so many. Australians' opposition labor parties launched a wastepedia booklet. I don't know what is that, Ben. What is a wastepedia booklet? I I don't know. I have an answer to that question. They've been accusing... Crikey, the, mate. No answer. Accusing the coalition government of over-lavish spending, including $400,000 on koala and other marsupial-related events. Well, we've got to protect our marsupials. Yeah. It's I, important. 
It's important to the Australian Connection economy. Connection isn't, isn't important. Uh, How much and are they was, spending on the Crocs, though? On the Crocs? Oh, man, not, yeah. not after our, God rest his soul, uh, Croc hunter, you know. Irwin. Good old Steve. <sighs> Who didn't get I, I cried a little bit. Mm-hmm. I cried a little was bit. Was it a croc, though? Wasn't a croc that took him Stingray. out? Stingray. No, no. That's, that's the irony. That's, that's what's so sad about it. But, it's yeah. never the things you fear. They never yeah. happen. It's always... I remember else. I was in an airport. I was actually on my way back to Australia in an airport in San Francisco. And it came up on the news. On my way back to Australia. At Steve Irwin, our greatest export, had passed away. Love that guy. Yep, so sad. Well, to go on to equally as serious news, Bomb Squad raided the airport in Adelaide to find, uh, because there was a report of a suspicious bag, mm. and it actually contained a bunny. Mm. That is suspicious, though. That is. I mean, if you think about it. <laughs> Australian news, folks. There was a New Zealand man moving away from Australia a little bit, fined for driving while suspended, while on a suspended license because he wanted a pie. Mm. No, so that no, made the news. no, that's a valid reason. Oh, shepherd's pie. I was just no, thinking No, 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 like a, a, a meat, meat pie. pie. A yeah. meat that's pie. a valid reason. And if you've never had a meat pie, America, I don't understand why you don't have a love and a fascination for meat pies. I don't understand where the disconnect is. You eat hot dogs and you eat steak and you eat all things meat, so why no love for the meat pie? Can you tell us what a meat pie is? It's basically like meat and gravy and a pastry. Mm, sounds delicious. It is delicious. And then you like put you know ketchup on the top of it, and you, and you eat it hot, and it's sounds, like it sounds a lot like a pot pie. Does it have any it's, vegetables? It's in a it? lot like a pot pie, but the the pastry on the bottom is a little more dense. It's not crumbly like a pot pie would be. And this is a handheld sort of a thing. And you hold it, yeah. It's, it's, it's a lunch food. Warm. You eat it warm. So it's like a calzone. Sounds delicious. It's kind of like a calzone, but no cheese. Well, you can get meat pies with cheese in them, but typically, yeah, it's delicious. And America, I don't understand. Hmm. I'm so confused as to the lack of. Maybe we need to. Maybe we need to. You know, start a GoFundMe for open uh, a meat pie. Open shop. a meat pie shop. There's one in Nashville, um, and there's a couple across the U.S., but it just it, it hasn't taken on. What's the one in Nashville called? I don't know. I we remember. need to encourage our Nashvilleans to go and try a meat yeah. pie. Go, go try meat pie. Go support your local Australian entrepreneurs in Nashville who are not just musicians. They're also restaurant owners and meat pie makers. We need somebody to figure out what the name of that place is and, and post it so we can we do, put yeah. a link. Yep. Well, I'm going to give you the rapid fire to wrap this up of just, the, just some of my favorite headlines that will make your day a little bit better if the regular news bores you. Man punches shark, saves own life. Mm, Port Stevens attack. <laughs> Apparently, something else that was um, they felt worthy of note. Australian men know breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Mm. So and, it uh, really is. It really is. And, and, we, and we know that we do. And a follow up: a boy bitten by a shark decides to ride his bike home for breakfast. <laughs> so it's, there's a lot of tough, tough people there. Australian man stops car theft with flying kick through passenger window. Maybe we can post <laughs> that. Like, oh, Dude, that's, that's impressive. I, I want to see a video of that. <laughs> we can post like, what, here's a good one. Why don't you die? Australians fight with a spider sparks police call. Well, uh, uh, unless you've been to Australia and seen the size of our spiders, then, you know, you could be like, well, I mean, it's just a spider, right? Yeah. Until it's the size of your head. And it eats birds. That's true. And this then you're like, Harry mm, Potter level spider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe call the police. And we'll end with something that will just, you know, hopefully re- reframe some things and give us all gratitude today for how well our lives are going. Uh, spider bites Australian man on penis, dot, 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 again. <laughs> Did you not learn your lesson the first time? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> this was is he, a wake up call. You need to evaluate. Cycling? <laughs> Was he nude cycling? Again. Maybe he was nude cycling again. I, I don't know. And he just had to stop to take a break and he I, sat down on the ground and, you know. It's true. I, I don't know if we mentioned I, that when we were recording, but there was like the largest ever nude bike rally in Australia. So maybe that's how it happened. But the again, <laughs> mm. I mean, it just. <laughs> this, is, this is more information than I need. <laughs> Oh man! So uh, yes, I got one more. I got one more before we move on. Yep. Um, police search for motorized picnic table drivers seen traveling through Perth's Scarborough Beach area. So I found the pictures. At least three groups of people. So uh, 
18 people who decided to get picnic tables, put a lawnmower motor underneath, four wheels, and they were drinking and driving the motorized picnic, picnic were people tables. sitting picnic on tables. the picnic tables. Oh yeah, they're sitting just you know on each side, and then one guy just they're just that motorized. Sounds kind of awesome. It's kind of like the the <laughs> one in Kansas City, the yeah, the pedal bikes where yeah. you you drink and pedal. I drove past it the other day and was like, "That's dumb." Now, do they ever do those in the nude? In the Drinking, nude? peddling. Maybe in Louisiana. I don't know. <laughs> It's the only place I can think of that it might be appropriate. Florida. I, this or Florida. Be, yeah. This could be like a whole new show. A video, Australian man tries to blow up ATM, fails miserably. <laughs> <laughs> man who destroyed karaoke machine with shovel is still on the loose. <laughs> <laughs> and to bring us back to guitar world, Australian man offers guitar eye view of a waterfall. He put a camera inside his acoustic guitar. And uh, I guess he's just uh, taking nature pictures through his guitar. Through his guitar. Yeah. Oh, that's, so that's we, kind of beautiful. Yeah, we got we got that. So it's a beautiful thing. Thank you for drawing us back into the world of guitar, Adam. Away yeah. from random Australian news, pointless. Uh, but you know, helps us with our day. Is joy pointless? No, yeah. it is not, Adam. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for such things. Speaking of joy. Uh, What's your favorite guitar line? I think that's what we decided we were going to talk about today. Like favorite guitar part? Part, yeah. Part. I was pointing something out to someone the other day. The uh, the guitar hook from Yellow by Coldplay. I remember the first time I heard that song. And still, I just, like if you go try to play that guitar line, the bent two strings against each other. It's yep. not. It's a pretty brave guitar part. <laughs> It's a commitment part because you can't kind of go, ah, I'm not really feeling it today. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's going to be a train wreck or it's going to be There's awesome. There's no halfway on that line. Yeah, they definitely sold us on uh, interesting guitar ideas. Coldplay went went there. I mean, you too, obviously, is the iconic mm -hmm. guitar part, especially if you uh, lived for any season of your life in the Christian worship world. <laughs> Then you've played about 40,000 variations of some U2 part um, over the years. So, I mean, U2 was iconic. You know, Streets Have No Name, yep. iconic yep. kind of guitar parts. But going back beyond before that, I mean, you got Hendrix and, I mean, guitar heroes that just changed everything. But I love some of the, the riff-driven lines. Like, you know, you think Whole Lot of Love by Led Zeppelin where it's like, it's not like the pretty high stuff. It's like the super drudgy, low, fuzzed out stuff. I love that stuff too. Some of the black, early Black Sabbath records. Uh, what's the documentary, Some Like It Loud? Mm -hmm. One of my favorite moments is Hendri or Hendrix. Oh my gosh. Jimmy Page is standing there with his Les Paul and just starts playing a whole lot of love. Nothing else. Just in front of one of his marshals. I think it is Gear Locker. And it was just so good. Yeah. It's like, I don't even need anything else. Right. It was, it's magical. It's magic. Oh, Ramble On. Mm. That's another one. I love I love that intro riff. I was listening to um, uh, David Bowie, Breaking Glass. I don't know if you remember that, but that intro is so awesome. I forget the guitar player's name, but that's one of my, one of my favorites too. Yeah, well, Ziggy Stardust. Yep. Oh, my gosh. The Zonk Machine. Guy made the Zonk Machine famous. That wicked fuzz. Well, then you got like, you know, 90s grunge, Nirvana, just pulling off some of the most bizarre parts Nasty. that just, you know, create a visceral emotion. We've already talked about that in other podcasts, how the guitar creates that visceral response. But and trios too. I think that's, that's such a hard skill that certain bands have just nailed. When you're in the studio, Crafting multiple parts to fit together is a skill as well. I probably feel more comfortable doing that. But then you see bands like Nirvana, it's a three piece mm -hmm. and every part has to be perfect, yeah. even if it's simple because there, there's nothing else ha happening. Right. And the bands that can do that, I mean, I guess Zeppelin as well. I mean, you have to fill up all that space without being too busy to cover up the vocals. And uh, I was learning some Nirvana stuff back in the day. And I remember thinking, oh, this isn't that hard. And I tried to sing what he was singing while playing that part. Oh yeah. And they're so, I mean, he played like a guitar player, not a singer because it, 
he wasn't just matching what he did. And I was like, this is the tricky part because these rhythms are not matching up and all that stuff. And I gained a lot of respect when I tried yeah. to do that. I was like, wow. I want to know the name of all of the four, you know, the fourth member of the band that was never seen, you know, the guy under the stage. <laughs> It's like how many how many bands have have the fourth member? And these days it's just tracks, but back before you had tracks, there was another guy yeah. in the background who was playing you know the other parts of the song. Is Boston like that? Because didn't the guy make it in his bedroom? Like he overdubbed, used like the the rock man box oh, yeah, or whatever, yeah. and I. But it had all those layers, so I think they said when they went out and played, they would have to have like five <laughs> guitar players, no tracks underneath the stage. So what do you think makes a good part then? Because I know we've been talking about that offline, but what makes a good guitar part? Obviously it's musical, it's uh, memorable, but you've been in the guitar world for a long time, Adam, and have played with a lot of different artists over the years and had to come up with parts spontaneously on the spot for a ton of stuff. So in your opinion, because this is all we have, My folks. Mm -hmm. All we have, folks, is our opinion. I, I've thought about this a lot. I've played on, um, I mean, I don't want to brag, but I've played on a lot of bad records. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and I've tortured myself with this question when you go home after the end of a, <laughs> a long day of trying everything. <laughs> and when you were talking about Yellow, it finally hit me one day. Wow, actually a song is what makes a great guitar part. Now, obviously there's some really great hooks and catchy thing. I mean, there's just certain riffs. If there was no song, you would still want to play those riffs. And that's a, you know, a skill for sure. But it is so tied to the song because I could be playing on a bad song and there's a bridge and I just, I'm just going to rip off yellow. Let's just see how this goes. It doesn't feel the same at all or something mm. similar. And I think that's what is frustrating too sometimes is it really, you, if you have a great song, it is so easy to produce it. And it's so easy to come up with a great part because you can just find the simplest little catchy thing and it works. And so I wish people would focus a little more on the song <laughs> content and structure. So basically just write good songs if write you want good, songs. good guitar parts, right? I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, well, I, could, I could get technical about like different things, of course, but I think that's the fundamental thing I noticed one day, which is kind of a bummer because then you walk in and maybe it's not a great song. And especially now producing, you start adding in, oh, how many 808s can I add in here? How many layers can I add? And you get to the end and you still go, eh, it sounds better, but this a live recording of Yellow on a cassette tape would still move me more. <laughs> it's a, Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Like the greatest guitar part in the world without a great song isn't isn't nearly the same streets have no name what if it was just that little hook and we saw someone playing it on youtube we'd be like oh that's that's cool nice yeah. to lay sound it wouldn't feel like the magic that it is so but you've the been magic. a songwriter for years so yeah i don't write you... the i don't write the guitar parts though i, I know i call but... my smart friends who <laughs> and say hey <laughs> i need you to come and Write something. Well, and then you uh, have the there's the the importance of the part being good, and then you have some parts aren't even that great, but the performance and the passion is what makes it so awesome. Uh, there's an artist we know, and I remember him saying one time, "I could just go out and sing one word." When we were kind of getting into a little bit of a debate about songwriting, and I think I was pushing him like, "You should, you should, we should spend more time on the songs before we go to the next step." And he had said, I could just go sing one or two words and like everybody would be really into it. And I said, yeah, because your performance is so great. You are such a great performer, such a great vocalist. Live and in the moment, yeah, everyone's going to love it. It's kind of like doing the, playing a little extra in a guitar solo live. It totally works because everyone's in, in it and you can just kind of be a little insane and a little fun and it's going to be awesome. Oh yeah, because nobody's listening to it 45,000 times over and over and over again. At, um, mediocre volume right right and all of that and so there's certain songs where i think it's more the performance and the passion i think of a uh, rage against the machine like bulls on parade i mean it's one note and it's a really catchy rhythm but the way they play it together is so amazing and i remember him saying they auditioned a bunch of drummers for the band and the way he auditioned them was he would just play that one note riff 
and everybody was like, nah, nah. And then who, I don't remember his name, but the drummer, he said he played it twice and the guy just goes, and just came right in like no qu- and he was like hired <laughs> so i like the passion parts too well i know that even as a songwriter because we've got a project that we're working on um that is based off of guitar riffs mm-hmm. first and then we write afterwards and so a good guitar riff or good guitar part can inspire a great song Absolutely. as well so you know adam that's true don't, i get don't be a slacker. Thinking session players you normally are coming into a preset Right, uh, song, and you're just kind of adding some color there. And uh, if the song isn't good enough, you can't add enough color to make up for that. <laughs> uh, Bulls on Parade is two notes, right? That riff? Am I thinking Octa- of the wrong riff? Well, no, no, oh, no yeah. you're right. I was just thinking octave, but and the rhythm's so catchy, but in the sense of melodically and everything, right? But the passion, the tones, like it just feels so good. Yeah. Well, but I mean, the fundamentals of any songwriting is rhythm and melody, and so when you when you have that rhythm mixed with that good melody, because a good melody is just a sing, it's notes, it's the rhythm that helps make the melody make sense. I think they said rhythm. I've heard rhythm is actually the most important from a lot it's of the most memorable. It's the most mm-hmm. memorable thing. Like you could tap out jingle bells with one note and people would know what it is. So actually when I'm writing parts, a lot of times I will think of the rhythm first. I'll try to come up with a mm. catchy rhythm. And uh, I actually heard, I saw something with Paul Gilbert the other day when he said he's thinking of his licks. He tries to think of the fills that a drummer would play. Because mm. he goes, I can just play really fast, but it just kind of is like, like this, you can't tell. He goes, but if I think of drum fills, do, 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 do. He makes everything catchier. So I try to think rhythm sometimes first, I guess, yeah. of the melody. What yeah. about you, Dave? You know what I was noticing the other day? I was listening to um, the new John Mayer, and I don't remember which song it was, but it's got a great guitar solo in it. And he does this thing that I love um, where he wrote a segment of the song for the guitar solo. So the song changes keys, goes to a whole different feel, just for the guitar solo. Yep. And it gives the guitar solo this really interesting thing because the whole song just changed in order to bring this part in. And I love good guitar solos and I love memorable guitar solos. And that's something that I've um, noticed a lot of songwriters and, and guitar players that I love do. I, I remember first time I noticed that I think was a government mule track where like the whole song changes keys and every the feel changes and uh, just for this guitar solo. And then I started noticing that more and more different places. But John does that on his new record. Huh. And I like it. It's a great solo. Yeah. It, that's, so, that. that's a great point because I remember mul- multiple, multiple times, uh, sometimes with the live artists, they would point back uh, just out of the blue if they wanted the solo. And even if I played something that I was kind of happy, I'm okay, like the, I think the playing was pretty good. Like mm-hmm. that was nice. It just never felt right. And right. Um, I watched an interview with, uh, maybe it was one of the producers of, Van Halen or something like that. And they were saying, if you notice all of Van Halen's songs, the choruses in general are major and something people can dance, you know, dance to it's pop every solo, they just go to the six. Mm. And so the solos sound so rock and roll in the midst of a pop song, but it's because he just always makes sure that I think his longest solo in a song is 18 seconds. Most of them are 12, very short, go to the minor and it sounds rock and roll. And then you go right back to this happy chorus. Mm. Get the, get the ladies Ross dancing. Explanation was he goes, well, the girls are coming for the songs, <laughs> and so we got to write you know dancey songs, and the guys will be there if the girls are there and they want to see solos. So we make sure the song is. It's kind of genius, actually. Like, That's fair. <laughs> so, that, so there we go. There's a trick for you. Uh, write a segment to include for the guitar player to play a solo right. in your live music settings. Go to the six. Go to the six. <laughs> go to the minor and go just six minor and then just go for it. Blaze know. for twelve seconds and just then go back to the song. But, but only give them twelve seconds. <laughs> that's, that's actually it. the well. That's that's another good point. That's another good point. To your guitar player, don't belabor the solo. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, if Eddie Van Halen's average solo is twelve seconds, then how dare I ever think I can fill up <laughs> meaningful content longer than twelve seconds? It's the whole like reach exceeding your grasp. I think he was like. I can I can sustain this really well for twelve seconds. So, <laughs> okay, twelve seconds of greatness in twelve me. seconds of greatness is better than thirty <laughs> seconds of mediocrity. And that's it. Ooh. It's all over. That's right. Amazing. <laughs> Any other thoughts on parts? I, mean, we, uh, I don't know. 
write good ones. Write good ones. And if you're playing a song that somebody already wrote great parts on, and you have 22 minutes to come up with a new part, maybe just play the part that was already written in the studio by the session player with the producer. I know. That is. <laughs> you talking about specific circumstances? I'm just talking about <laughs> maybe Sunday mornings. <laughs> when you think you're going to come in and write a better part than the band and the player and the producer did, you might be able to. You might, yes. Yeah, I'm not saying don't stifle creativity, Dave. Well. But, you know, some, sometimes those parts are written for a good reason because they actually work. You think it's ignorance or you think it's arrogance? Because I've thought about that. You're like, oh, this guy hired yes. a producer and a session guitar player. And you're like, I didn't really listen. In three minutes, I'll come up with a better part. Do you, it's like, do you, you remember be being that guy, though? I always tried to play the part. I did not grow up ever taking lessons or having to read music or playing in jazz ensembles or anything like that. So I would miss some of the nuances. I'd hear a melody, which is why I, uh, I try to pay re- a lot of attention now, especially producing. You just realize how important all those micro things are. And so I would like hit the melody right, but then they might say, well, I think the picking pattern was different. There's like little minutia things that I wouldn't think to pick up on because I would just hear the melody, hear the tone. And I think people forget, which I did that a bunch till I started producing more. You're building a house and all these parts fit together perfectly. So if you change the guitar part, well, that might not work with the synth arpeggio now because your picking pattern is going to step on it. So either everyone has to change or you just need to play what is written there for the you know, cohesive hmm. sake, cohesion for the sake of cohesion. For the sake of cohesion, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a good band name for you. That one's for free. For the sake of cohesion. For the sake for the of sake cohesion. Of cohesion. <laughs> no, I remember being the guy who you know I came from a real improvisational background and listened to lots of music like that, and so you know, and I and I played with people who were really all about that, and so you know, playing a part that had already been written or that someone else had already played was kind of like, why would I want to do that? So I think I brought that with me into Sunday mornings and, you know, playing with other people was just like, well, we'll just write something or I'll just come up with something on the spot. And I think it was quite a few years in before it occurred to me that like, if we're playing a song and we're trying to capture the feel and the vibe of something that people have heard a lot of times, because then it's an easier on-ramp, why would I try to, why would I think that I could come up with something better in a few minutes than they did in the studio? You but, better you hope know. the bass player and the drummer aren't thinking that same way too, because then we're on. Yeah, for <laughs> That's real. nice about being guitar. We just kind of float over. But if the drummer's like, I'm just going to change all this up, <laughs> the bass player's changing the chords. We'd be <laughs> you know what? Don't like this beat. I'm, I'm going to do something else. I've got a better beat. I got, a, I got something better for you. Watch it's this. a personality Watch flaw, because I have that, Dave. It's, I think, you know, if you're into the Enneagram, it's the Enneagram 4 thing. And I've said those words to our friend Cassie. I go, oh, man, I don't know if I would want to do more tours, because I think of all the time I have to spend learning parts and I'm like, someone already, somebody already wrote those parts. They're awesome. Not even, you know, that's why I never learned a ton of cover songs. I'd learned bits and pieces, but in my head, I kind of go, well, the edge already played that part. I'm never going to play it as good as the edge. So I'll just kind of take the idea. And it was definitely, I had to grow in that because it felt a little soul killing. I spent four hours learning someone else's part for me to play it once. I probably won't play it as well as the guy that wrote it. It wasn't even very satisfying. <laughs> I feel like a typewriter, Ben. I feel like a corporate job. I'm just typing up newsletters. Oh, you're an inkjet. Inkjet. Spinning Ooh, out just the pages. Oh, spinning out Or as Ben would say, karaoke. At least typewriters are cool. That's yeah. That's cool school typewriters. You want to be a typewriter, but you're an inkjet. <laughs> was, well, yeah, and I think, I think there is a balance between being a karaoke band. Mm-hmm. And being somebody that's playing parts that matter and that are meaningful. Because you can play things that are like, hey, that guy wrote a great part. I'm going to play that part. Because it works and it fits and I can play it with life and energy or I can sing it with, you know, it's like I can sing it with life and energy and it not be karaoke where I'm literally just doing a worse version of somebody else's songs, which does tend to happen a lot. 
Wait, karaoke isn't as good as the real thing? Well, I mean, I'm speaking specifically of what I would call Sunday morning karaoke. Oh. Uh, in a lot of environments that happen on Sunday mornings. Uh, so I'm not saying don't play the parts. I'm also saying but play it with the same, you know, energy in life and intentionality mm. that would that it sort of would mean something rather than just, you know, replicating a karaoke part. Because at that point in time, they may as well just put all the tracks up and pull everybody else on the stage down, if you know what that I mean. That would be a lot easier. I mean, that does happen. And then at that point in time, why don't we just play the YouTube video of the actual original artist it's true. Know, on the big screen? I'm a big fan of that idea. <laughs> so, I mean, I get to sleep in. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, I don't have to get up early for church on Sunday mornings. Yes, maybe. Well, I, I wish somebody would have... You know, you could have heard something a ton of times and someone says something a little bit differently and the light light bulb just kind of goes off. Or with an accent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it just clicks. And I wish I would have actually learned more cover songs growing up because I was mm -hmm. more jumped right into, you play guitar and I'll start writing all your own parts and playing with people like that. And I went back retroactively uh, later on and started learning classic songs. And when I viewed them, as a way to learn how a great part is written. I actually enjoyed the process of that kind of minutia of learning exactly how it would go. Mm -hmm. And then I started finding chord voicings and different things that I just thought, oh, I never would have thought to play this like yeah. this. And then you can incorporate it. So if you don't have any organized music training like I did, at least learn some of the classic genre, great riffs and parts, because at least it will teach you how to how to write great parts. You don't give a kid a violin, teach him scales and say, you know, go write a symphony. You have to, you train for years, you learn what a great part is yeah. before you can write it. So I wish I would have had that moment earlier. Yeah, I, think, I think both is really important because I, I've watched and I've played with people who were classically trained, who were brilliant, who couldn't play unless they had music in front of them. And that was always kind of a bummer. And then I've played with people who were classically trained, brilliant, violinist, cellist, whatever, and they could also just kind of, you could give them a chord progression and they can play along and come up with something. Um, but I think learning something note for note is really important. I didn't do a lot of that um, real early on. We just kind of learned to cop something. But I remember when I started really trying to learn to play something exactly the way it was played on the record, like you learn a lot from that. It's huge. Yeah. I, I, did. I still have trouble. I'm so I actually the other day I was going through trying to find some new songs to learn to break me out of my patterns of thinking. Yeah, I do, I would do the same thing with songwriting for those that are maybe out there who are songwriters or you know kind of singer songwriters. I would go and learn old songs because you learn the way that they're writing as well. Mm -hmm. So when you're listening to the song and you're like learning how to play it, you, you're seeing the patterns that they've put into the song that make it work. And so it's, an, it's a good way to get kind of broken out of your box a little bit. Yeah. I think it's because we, we don't apply, we don't think about what we're doing a lot of times because uh, I, I know people that don't play guitar that much and someone will mention some song and they've gone online and learned the tab. And so they can play that song. Um, and I'm like, oh, I've never, I've never learned that song, but they can't really play guitar. And I saw something with John Mayer where he was talking about that. Like some people know how to play gravity, but they don't know how to play the guitar. So you have to learn both. And if you're gonna learn a part, make sure that once you have it under your fingers, you go back and you analyze, why is this working? Like, what are they thinking about? What else is happening in the song? Mm -hmm. Why, the, why the is this so cool? Behind. Yeah. Because sometimes I think people don't do that. So then it's like, well, why am I learning cover songs? You don't know how to play the guitar. You need to have your own voice, which all of that is true. So if you're going to learn the cover stuff, make sure you do the mental work to kind of figure out why it works great so you can use yeah. that. What's the chord progression? What key are we in? And honestly, playing covers is fun. It yeah. is because fun. they're great songs. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason great songs are, are popular famous, right. and famous. It's because they're great they're songs. Great and so, songs. man, being able to play some of those songs, I remember... And I was living in Kentucky a while back and had a friend of mine. We did this show in a little pub and it's just him and I, like an acoustic guitar. And and it was so much fun. Just, you know, because it's like you're just taking really, really good songs and just playing them. And, yeah, it's just, it's good fun. Good, clean fun. Good, clean. Well, it's, a you know, I enjoy it more now because when you have to write all of your own stuff all the time, 
it's kind of awesome to be able to just play guitar and I'm not thinking if the part I wrote is great. We know it's a great part. All I have to do is play it and it's a great song. There's no self-analysis. Kind of, self there's no self-analysis as long as I don't hit a wrong note. So. Well, and I think that's a, there is a danger in those who do play a lot on Sunday mornings at certain church environments, uh, which is a large part of the guitar pedal industry. For better or for worse, uh, a lot of people are playing Sunday mornings at church, and I think the danger of doing just that environment is that you can kind of lose the sense of, of musicianship or songwriting outside of a very specific genre. It's like you're only playing one type of music and one type of setting over and over and over again, and you can kind of lose, you know, the joy of what it's like to play outside of those environments. You know, I always think about like Jet. Remember Jet, the band was like uh, just such like great music. And I always wanted to be in a band like that, which we kind of started a band like that, um, doing some kind of heavy riff uh, stuff. But it was just so much outside of the genre of kind of Christian worship Sunday morning stuff that I think it's – Sometimes you got to get outside of that to remember that sometimes music can just be enjoyable for the sake of playing music. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be so, you know, in Sunday morning intentional for certain purposes and certain reasons. And, you know, this is not a Christian podcast, so I don't have to go into those. Um, but it can be very, very specific what happens for a lot of people on Sunday mornings instead of just like music can just be enjoyable because it's just music. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, to even say to the great thing about worship on Sunday morning is uh, churches are the last live music venues, re really, that someone can play with other musicians consistently at a younger age and get into. Uh, there's a guy in Kansas City, Michael, and I know for a lot of years he was making a good living. He's older, I think 60s now. And uh, he said he was, you know, gigging six nights a week. Monday was a, you know, like a jazz gig somewhere. And then Wednesdays was a country gig and he had all these different things. And you could make a living because there were so many clubs with live music. And he said, when DJ started coming in, you know, I think nineties really, he said early nineties, mid nineties, the clubs just found out it was so much cheaper to hire one person, which has shrank the amount of times that people can as younger kids go play in clubs, even if they're bad, but get that experience. And so churches are one of the last places you can actually go play. And I think the downside yeah, is- Yeah, and not be high risk. High risk. Yeah, it's low risk involvement, you know, and I think that would be my challenge to a lot of churches and a lot of worship guys is don't create an environment that, that doesn't allow risk taking mm -hmm. for, especially for younger musicians, because those those musicians need a place to be able to fail and it be safe. Um, and if that doesn't exist, then who's going to keep playing guitar? If the if you don't have any live exposure, any like real time exposure to be able to play and make a mistake and it be okay. And so it's like making sure that we continue to have those environments where you can fail. You know, and I think you know my daughter's in band and choir at school, and it's like, is that the only? Is that the last place? You know. <laughs> You know, other than churches that, that you can like be bad at music and, and it'd be okay. And I think churches still need to have places where you can kind of be bad. I remember my early experiences as a musician in church and the guy leading the service was like hammering on the, on the pew to keep me in time because I was a drummer and I was like just starting to play and he was so frustrated because I wasn't playing in time. So he's like pounding on this thing to make sure that I was playing in time, but they still let me play. Yep. Yep. They still let me come back. They still let me try. And I got better and better and better. It's like, but you know, if you don't have those environments, um, you know, or you're not being told, hey, learn the part play the part, play that part, learn it exactly the way that it is. Right. Not because we're stifling your creativity, but because you'll learn things about how to play if you learn how to play yeah, that start part. Start there at least. Come in start, and knowing yeah. that part exactly. And then if you want to do something better than that, that you like more than that, and it works, great. But come in knowing that part. Because school doesn't do the same thing as uh, is playing in front of an audience that doesn't care about you. That's not parents. Because really, if you play music... <laughs> <laughs> if you play music, you're, we're playing for other people. That's always been the point of the arts was to entertain people. Uh, I was watching some video with some lady. It was like a TED Talk thing. And she was saying she's a horrible singer. But growing up, uh, they didn't have TV or anything in Ireland. And she said we would 
have friends over every weekend and everybody would go around and tell a funny story or sing or do something. And she didn't want to sing one night because she said she wasn't good. And her mom came up and said to her, you're not singing for you. You're singing to bring joy to other people. And so when you play in front of an audience, you get that immediate response. Uh, I was watching the Van Halen documentary and I, they played for years at Gazzari's, I think it was called, which is a I think it's, I don't think it's a high class place, but they had young bands come in and that's where they would get their start. And you have that immediate response. If people don't like you, if your part didn't work, you can work all of that out. So having live places is really. Yeah, I mean, when I was touring years ago, I mean, we would try songs on the road and you know pretty quickly if yeah. that song was good and create a response or not. And so if it didn't, you just drop it and you <laughs> move on to the next city and you criticism, try another one. Criticism is the greatest teacher. <laughs> yeah. If it's from people that are just honestly giving it, they don't know you, they don't care about you existentially, they're just gonna let you know, you might need to work on that song more. And that's so helpful. Yeah, your mom will always think it's a great song. Exactly, yeah. Hence it's the reason why, helpful. yeah. Yeah, she, I think she's been offended because I've told her before, like, thank you for telling me you really like this song or whatever, but it doesn't really mean a whole lot because you tell me that for everything that I do. So I said, if you could sprinkle your in mom, some- Your yeah, mom my or your mom, wife? My mom. Oh, your mom. <laughs> yeah. Well, my wife would tell me when something's not as good. Yeah, that's, <laughs> she, that's she's gonna be my- story. Story. She didn't like the change we made eh. to one of the patron saint songs. She was like, yeah, I don't like it as much. I'm like, well, thank you for your honest feedback. <laughs> Your honesty. I'm gonna go finish crying, and then I'll go work on writing something else. I right, tell my wife, you got to sprinkle in some negativity in there so that the compliments mean something. Which, Otherwise, yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. So I told my wife, if I tell you I love you every single day, I'm like, yeah. yeah. If I tell you like once every three years, right? It means it means more. more. Yeah, it means man, something. That's, that's yeah. great advice. It's <laughs> great, great marriage advice. <laughs> I was at a friend of mine's wedding that I was in, and uh, we lived together a long, long time, and never talked about our feelings, just walked in the door and like pizza, he'd say, yeah, that's, that's it. But if we needed something, we were there. And before his wedding, he wrote me a, like a letter and we were all up at a cabin. And uh, I told Kelsey, I said, He's, it meant so much because we don't just go around all the time telling each other how much like- <laughs> How much we love each other. It's been 12 years and it meant a lot. And then in another right. 12 years, something <laughs> else will happen right. and we'll have that moment. Hopefully in another 12 years, I'll get another letter, right? Yes. So. Think all right. Well, thanks for listening to us ramble on a whole bunch of stuff. I promise to edit out this stuff uh, that is least important in this very long episode. For you, dear listener of guitar amplification podcasts, um, and, uh, you know, tune in again at some point when we ramble about something else. Indeed. And we do that a lot. <laughs>